When we're performing tests on protection equipment, there is always the potential for personal danger because of the proximity of live circuits. Whether you're working in the field or in the test lab, this danger can certainly be minimized if you're aware of the hazards and take the necessary precautions. Before we enter a substation or other working station, we must know precisely what our task is and the activities to be performed. We should also know what safety measures are to be carried out before commencing the work and then what safety precautions must be adopted while performing the tests. Even before entering the locale, we must notify the system operator as to the nature of work to be performed and receive authorization to work. Never proceed without this clearance. Ideally, you should mark up prints to indicate where isolation and grounding is required for safety and confirm this with the system operator. He may point out that the work area is already isolated and ready for work. You must still check this. Verify that where required, all disconnects are opened, fuses pulled, switches or valves are in the protective position, and all sources of energy are isolated. Has the equipment been adequately grounded? You should always test to ensure that the appropriate circuits are actually dead. Various approved testers are available for different voltage levels, such as hotline indicators, buzz sticks, glow detectors, multi-range voltage detectors, super testers. Always prove the tester on a live circuit before checking that your circuit is actually dead. When grounding equipment, remember to attach your grounding cable to the ground first, and then to the equipment. Generally, several grounds are attached. Remember to work between these grounds. Barricades should be placed around the work area with warning notices. This is to keep other personnel clear. All isolating points should be marked with the appropriate tags. Sample tags are indicated in your workbook. You must, of course, be completely familiar with your company clearance procedures, including tagging. Before commencing work, the test crew should review the scope of work to be performed, check prints, and identify potential hazards. For example, if a test voltage or current is to be applied, any secondary circuits and exposed connections should be isolated and tagged as they may become energized. Also, it is good practice to remove personal items such as wristwatches, rings, keys, and so on, as they have been known to contact live circuits in delicate relay work and cause damage and perhaps injury. When performing functional testing, be sure that your test instruments are calibrated and in good working condition. Test leads must be well insulated and free of cuts and abrasions. Always use the proper tools for the job. Wear your protective gear when necessary, and above all, do not become distracted. Stay alert and keep abreast of safety procedures at all times. Good housekeeping is extremely important while performing tests. Cables, wires, and tools spread around the work area are certainly conducive to accidents. All connecting leads should be kept neat and rooted out of walkways. Remember that a relatively small accident, say tripping over a temporarily connected cable, may conceivably cause the victim to fall onto live terminals on a panel, possibly inflicting considerably more injury. When testing relays, we would always prefer to de-energize the equipment and, if possible, remove the relay from its casing. However, we know that this is not always possible. In this situation, make the test block connections, such as external shorts and open potential circuits, before inserting the test block into the relay case. It is often necessary for us to work on live circuits. In this situation, be extremely careful to avoid contact with grounded objects. Otherwise, your body may provide a path to ground. Stand on a rubber mat if possible. You'll remember that in an earlier videotape, we discussed at some length the hazards of working on live equipment and recommended precautions to protect equipment as well as personnel. So far, we've been looking at very general safety precautions that apply to most work activities around the switchyard. However, there are also a number of specific hazards 
that very much affect the relay technician. For example, many relays include a capacitor as part of their internal circuitry. Even if the relay is de-energized, the capacitor will hold its charge for some considerable time. If you happen to place yourself across the capacitor, you'll be in for a very nasty shock. Make sure to always short the capacitor terminals before touching it. In this regard, capacitor banks can be particularly hazardous because of the high voltage and large capacity. In most installations, a discharge resistor is built into each capacitor. When the capacitor is disconnected from the power system, the resistor will discharge the unit down to, say, 50 volts within about five minutes. However, be aware. Experience has shown that if the resistor and capacitor are defective, it may result in the capacitor bank and also the supporting metal structure becoming energized. Make sure that you follow your utility's safety rules when working on capacitor banks. Another potential hazard for relay technicians involves work around potential or voltage transformers, even when disconnected. For example, when the low voltage side is energized from the test equipment, the high voltage side will provide a very high voltage across its terminals. On other occasions, you may be performing troubleshooting tests on an energized VT or PT. In this case, remember never to short circuit the secondary winding. This can prove disastrous to you as well as to the transformer. With current transformers, we have an opposite problem to the VT. We must remember to never open circuit the secondary of an energized current transformer. Very high voltage can develop across the open circuit terminals, often above 10,000 volts. Therefore, when you're measuring CT secondary current, be careful not to use any meter which contains an internal fuse. Also, make sure that the CT connection switches are all closed at the relay panel. You should always take extreme caution when dealing with grounds. Never disconnect a ground connection, as your body may then provide the path for ground currents. All cabinets and metallic structures in a station are normally connected to the station ground mat, so they are all ostensibly at the same ground potential. However, certain incoming cables, such as communications circuits and pilot wire circuits, may be related to ground at a remote location. Remember that this remote ground potential may be different from the local ground potential in the station. This is particularly exaggerated in the case of a line fault when ground current flows through the earth. You will remember that we discussed this matter and associated hazards in an earlier videotape in this series. The point is, you should always be wary of ground connections, particularly on incoming shielded cables. Shielding is necessary on control wiring and communications circuits to minimize interference from nearby electromagnetic and electrostatic sources. If the shield is grounded at the remote end, it may offer a high potential difference to ground in the local station. For more information on this subject, refer to videotapes 19 and 20 in this series. A typical guide for shielding and grounding is included in your workbook. It's clear that the relay technician must always be alert to not get hurt. Always follow your company procedures when carrying out any task. If you have any doubts, consult your supervisor and make sure that you really understand the hazards of every aspect of your work. Please switch off the tape now and review this material in your workbook.